And as you will lead us today in our scripture. Today's scripture is Acts 2, 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' instructions and the communal life, to the breaking of bread and prayers. A reverent fear overtook them all, for many wonders and signs were being performed by the apostles. Those who believed lived together, shared all things in common. They would sell their property and goods, sharing the proceeds with one another as each had need. They met in the temple and they broke bread together in their homes every day. With joyful and sincere hearts, they took their meals in common, praising God and winning the approval of all the people. Day by day, God added to their number those who were being saved. This poem is called Thirst and it's by Mary Oliver. Another morning and I wake with thirst for the goodness I do not have. I walk out to the pond and all the way God has given so, so, us such beautiful lessons. Oh Lord, I was never a quick scholar, but sulked and hunched over my books, past the hour and the bell. Grant me in your mercy a little more time. Love for the earth and love for you are having such a long conversation in my heart. Who knows what will finally happen or where I will be sent. Yet already I have given a great many things away, expecting to be told to pack nothing except for the prayers which, with this thirst, I am slowly learning. Will you join me in prayer? God of movement and the moment, from the beginning you have called us together to be in covenant, to be in community, to become and grow with one another. You have called us to care for one another and all creation. When we like sheep stray from you and your desire, you call for us. Your gentle voice reminds us that nothing can keep us from your love. You called us into being and you call us into becoming. May we continue to listen for you and to meet you in those places to which you call us. May the words from my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts bring comfort to those who seek it and conviction to those who need it. And may these things be pleasing unto you. In your holy name we pray. Amen. They devoted themselves to the apostles' instructions and communal life, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Well, you might be wondering who they are and what the apostles' instructions were. Well, Acts 2 verses 37 to 41 goes something like this, as Peter spoke to the people of Israel. They asked Peter and the other disciples, what are we to do? Peter replied, you must express your regret for your shortcomings and be baptized, washed clean, in other words, purified. Each of you, that you may be forgiven, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was to you and your children that the promise was made and to all those still far off whom God, our God calls. And in support of this testimony, Peter used many other arguments and kept saying, save yourself from the corrupt generation. They were convinced by his arguments and they accepted what he said and they were baptized. That very day about 3000 were added to the number of those converted. So there's the what and the who. And for today's purpose, let's refer and think of converted as becoming, becoming dedicated, or to following and saying yes. And I think about these passages in my own, in relation to my own spiritual and political journey, and my circles of community that have been built who and where I was at any given time, the change, the movement from who I was then to who I am now, and to live into the promise of what is to come. The joys and the struggles, the paths, the detours, the getting back on the paths, the detours, receiving God's invitations, taking pause, and ultimately saying yes. 
leading me to this moment, to this community, and the intersections of my many communities of belonging and becoming. In her pastoral perspective commentary for Feasting on the Word, Susan B. W. Johnson writes this, quote, how does one convey the promise and momentum of a movement? Countless books and films have attempted to express not only the fight for colonial self-determination during the Re American Revolution, but the depth of unity, collaboration, and camaraderie of colonists. Again, books, movies, poetry, and song could not express the reverence, solidarity, and resolve that were experienced by participants in the civil rights movement in the United States, nor could these media adequately portray the struggle. The American Revolution and the Civil Rights Movement are just two examples of historical social movements with both spiritual and political underpinnings and goals that authors, poets, historians, composers, painters, sculptors, photographers, filmmakers, and others have attempted to convey. Participants in each of these shifting times experience profound internal wrestling, wide-ranging and conflicting styles of leadership, and intense periods of hardship and oppression, and yet emerge from those experiences with a deeply exhilarating sense of renewed human community, a kind of transformation that is difficult to describe to someone who was not there. Luke is neither a historian nor a journalist in the modern sense, but the book of Acts is our most comprehensive history of the spiritual and political moment movement that gave birth to the early Christian church. Beginning with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Acts chronicles the deliberations and the actions of the church at Jerusalem and the spread of Christianity across Greece and, Greece and Asia Minor, culminating in the Apostle Paul's very public Christian presence in Rome. And as we move through Acts, what we think of as the Christian church is everything from an offshoot of its parent faith tradition to a radical sect. It is a tentative moment and a street festival, a subversive activity and a public forum, a new current within Judaism and its own distinct and separate religion. This did not happen all at once or through a tidy progression, but through the grace of God the faith of individuals, and the sometimes very messy expressions of human resolve." And her quote. The long and the short, people saying yes to a movement, to a moment, and changing, becoming and belonging to something new. Or as Reverend Bregg McBride of Empower Initiative says, meeting the moment or the moment meeting you. And you might ask, who is Ben McBride? Well, he is a spiritual leader and longtime activist for peace and justice in the Bay Area. He's the guy at the Peninsula Solidarity Cohort meeting after the Harriet Tubman statue unveiling at Millbay Bart, who invited me to be a part of the Alabama Learning Cohort that went to Birmingham, Montgomery, and Selma right, as Alabama as a civil rights history tour and an organizational culture building and leadership development of empowerment towards a transformation from systems that contribute to structural racism and oppression. A new belonging and becoming. The very thing that the church was doing and was built upon and should be continuing to do. I don't know about you, but I was not around for the American Revolution. And I, as a five-year-old in San Francisco, was barely cognizant of the civil rights movement from 1954 to 1968. The attempt to abolish legalized racial segregation, discrimination, and disenfranchisement throughout the United States. Something that had been going on since the Reconstruction era of 1865 to 1877. Most of what I knew prior to this trip was based upon history taught or not taught, but discovered. 
During this journey of a cultivated religious-based cohort of 35, four of us who were melanin deficient, we prayed, we discussed, we learned something new, things we didn't know, things that they don't tell you, and we dined three meals a day. And we traveled by bus through what I will call the holy trinity of two cities and a country town and three churches, holy ground. This scaling triangle map of communities were a nexus creating the vortex of nonviolent resistance and civil disobedience heard and felt around the world. The proximity is roughly Foster City to Salinas, Foster City to Santanella if you're going for pea soup, or from Salinas to Santanella if you're going for pea soup. <laughs> now, Dexter Avenue, King Memorial Baptist Church, Montgomery, Alabama, 90 miles southeast of Birmingham, the capital of Alabama and of the Confederacy. One of the largest slave markets in the South was in Montgomery. Dexter Avenue was a renaming of what was originally called Market Avenue. And you can imagine why it was called Market Avenue. This black church, which was built between 1883 and 1889 is situated just steps away from the Capitol building and blocks up from the former slave market and the historic court square fountain. And it's across, and across the street from which is the Rosa, Marks, Rosa Parks Memorial, that bus stop and that bus ride that made history. And right across the street, just a little bit up, is a monument to the Confederacy. And across the street from that, is a monument to the civil rights movement starting in 1965. Dexter Avenue Church was the center for the 1955 and 1956 Montgomery Church boycott, Montgomery bus boycott. And it was the first locally initiated mass protest against racial discrimination and a model for other grassroots demonstrations. We always hear about Rosa Parks but there were four other women prior to Rosa Parks who refused to give up their seats. One of them was a 15 year old pregnant, darker black girl who they didn't want to use. There was another young woman who just this last year, I believe, was exonerated. Her record was expunged for refusing to get up her seat in 1955. Next, we have the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. This is the church that is well known for the bombing that happened that killed the four little girls. Abby Mae Collins, Carol Denise McNair, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Rosamund Robertson. This is 60 years ago on September 15th, 1963. And Birmingham is a post reconstruction era industrial center of the South. And it was noted as the most segregated city in the United States, where from May 2nd to May 10th, 1963, thousands of young black boys and girls gathered at that church, singing, no one's gonna turn us around. Ain't nobody gonna turn me around. And then they hit the seats, uh, streets of Birmingham for what it was called the Birmingham Children's Crusade. Many of us through history may have known it as the Birmingham incident or something like that. We don't really know the details that across the street from this church in the Kelly Ingram Park, they would march to go downtown for a peaceful protest but they were met and attacked by police and police dogs. They were sprayed with water hoses and not just water hoses, but fire hoses. 
and carried off to jail by the busload. Children led the way of desegregation of businesses and of jail releases and the eventual passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Children from seven to 18 years old led the way. I think there's something in the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures about the child shall lead us. Next, we have the Brown AME Church in Selma. We don't hear about this one very often. It's 87 miles southwest of Birmingham. So you've got this going on, right? And it was built as a prayer movement in 1866. It's situated in the middle of the George Washington Carver Home Projects of 1952. And it was the starting point of the 50 miles Selma to Montgomery marches, the first and the most well-known being the Bloody Sunday attempt. Started from here to go across the Edmund Pettus Bridge to exercise constitutionally given voting rights for black people 48 years ago on March 7th and through the 21st. It was the offices for the Southern Christian Leadership Council. It was founded by Bayard Rustin as for the, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, founded by Bayard Rustin, who was a queer black Quaker, who you hear very little about. And it was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee offices, which was nurtured by Ella Baker, who mentored our good trouble friend, U.S. House Representative John Lewis. This was also the place to which people would retreat as they were being beaten and battered by mounted police and other people. Such a disrespect for a building that the mounted police actually rode into the building, still continuing to beat people in the sanctuary. Now, in all of this stuff, can move on. Organizations that did not get along, the NAACP, the National Advancement, a National Association for the Advancement of the Colored People, the Congress of Racial Equality, also known as CORE, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, they came together. These organizations that normally did not get along. Many of these organizations uh, rife with misogyny. They came together. They came together by grace and by faith in a very messy human resolve, and perhaps a meal or two for the greater good in churches that were different. All these churches were different by economic and social strata. And this preacher who we came to know was happy serving a little local upscale church in Montgomery. But he became the face of the civil rights movement through the vision of a queer black man and the actions of many others who go unnamed. He was called to that moment. He met the moment. They met violence and oppression with nonviolent resistance, teaching and organizing and building this movement. Was it meeting the movement or the movement meeting them? There's some days I feel like not much has changed or perhaps we are reverting back to some 60 plus years ago. And Richard Rothstein, the author of Color of Law, who spoke to our local San Mateo NAACP, uh, NAACP branch in November 2021, he said to us in that meeting, it's time for Civil Rights 2.0. Civil Rights 2.0. And I got such a strong feeling of that on this trip. And in the book, of, uh, in the book synopsis of Jesus and Nonviolence, a third way, Walter Wink, about, by Walter Wink, it reads like this. Quote, more than ever, Walter Wink believes the Christian tradition of nonviolence is needed as an alternative to the dominant and death-dealing powers 
of our consumerist culture and fractured world. In this small book, Wink offers a precis of his whole thinking about the issue, including the relation of Jesus and his message to politics and nonviolence, the history of nonviolent efforts, and how nonviolence can win the day when others don't hesitate to resort to violence or terror to achieve their aims. Now, this book was written in 2003. It could be very well written these last couple of years. And now more than ever, as we strive day by day to grow closer to God, we are called to pack nothing but our prayers and our nonviolent actions and thoughts and creativity to add to the number of those being saved. In our own very specific vision at Metropolitan Community Churches, we would say that we were in the business of saving lives, LGBTQ plus folk from spiritual violence and physical violence and suicide. We were not saving souls in the old traditional way, but I think that perhaps we might have been short-sighted because spiritual violence is soul crushing. And we need to express our remorse for the damage done. We need to be washed and purified, clean, baptized, reset. These days, the political parlance is about saving the soul of the nation or saving the soul of the party. And yes, there is this need for a conversion, but not in a therapy that make queer people straight, but a conversion to love and respect and solidarity meeting in the temple and breaking bread together or in our homes every day, receiving with joyful hearts and sincere hearts the common meals of love and praising God and winning the approval and giving goodwill to all the people. The church all around needs to open its doors and meet this new moment. And Ben said to us, you meet the moment or the moment meets you. If you do not meet the moment, you become a monument and not a movement. So I'm going to say to us today in this room, let's become a movement and not a monument. Amen. <laughs>